Okay. All right, gentlemen. So we're moving to the lathe now. So what's one primary difference between the lathe and the mill? What are we missing? Which axis? Y, y axis, right. So X is diameter, Z is length. Front of our stock or front of our parts, typically Z zero. Doesn't have to be. Um, Lots of times it, it makes sense that it will be, then everything from front of the part back is Z negative, just like manual lid, just like um, CNC lid operation. Um, really, most of our CNC turning projects are going to be really simple. Um, you know, I, I would encourage you to, to spend some time looking at some of these other controls. We have a lot, I mean, 99% of our controls are, are a Haas control. Uh, I myself have gotten real, pretty used to that. And then I went to a panic control, which my machines are straight panics, and I'm like looking up and down all the arrows, trying to figure out where I'm going. Um, so you've got uh, your work offsets, uh, and then you've got your tool offsets. For the stuff that we're doing on just the TL1s, which is primarily kind of where you guys will stay at, at least for the beginning, um, GBD4 is just going to be zero. Um, everything will be set from your tool length offsets. Um, it really GPT-4 doesn't change until you're starting to do work shifting and some other things like that, or you're using a tool arm. Let's go back and probably cover a bunch of this. Um, difference between some of our machines. So we've got the slant beds and then just that flat um, bed with the flat turret on it. Those turrets have four uh, turning options on them, basically. Uh, we've got upgrades that are coming this summer that will bring them up to eight. Um, here's something I think that you guys loved um, doing last time with indicating um, this. So here's, here's the, the challenge. Like, when you go out to a shop, this is every tool. Like, there was a lot of struggles where people were like, Dude, this sucks trying to set this one tool up, but I was just, I was just kind of giggled because I'm like, right, but on a slam bed, that's every tool, you know. So, um, you know, sometimes they, they come in really fast, sometimes they don't. Uh, that's a coax indicator, so um, it, the face stays the same the entire time. But indicating is is just you know just part of it. Um, this is for tool nose freeze compensation. Typically, we're, we're comping our tool nose radius. So like if we have a part that has a 50 thousandths radius in the corner, so let's just say we've got a part that runs like this. And we want to put a radius in this corner here. So you've got, let's just say it's 50 thousandths radius in there. You can do a couple different things. You can program tool nose radius compensation, which will take the tool nose out of that tool. Okay, so your insert has some radius built into it, right? So it's got 30, if it's a 432, it's got a 30,000 radius. If it's a 431, it's got a 15,000 radius in it. And so you can program this with the 50,000 radius in it, and then no matter what insert that you use, it'll always work, which is really the smarter way to do it. But honestly, that's not the way that most people do it. Um, most people know that you've got a 30,000 tool nose radius, so they're going to program this as a 20,000 tool nose radius. The problem is when, I, when I'm roughing, that's great. When I go to finishing, um, it's, it's going to be the wrong radius, so I've got, to, I've got to compensate my radius and go, okay, I need to program everything to the finish radius, or I need to program everything to the rough radius, or I need to make sure that those two things jive you know, at some point where they change. Um, so, like I've told myself the other day, I was I was messing with my lathe, and I thought I should probably get into the habit of using tool nose radius compensation. And so, here's how you know if you're, if you're programmed using it. T um, zero one zero one zero one. So, turret location offset tool nose radius compensation. 
So you'll end up with three different ones on there. And so then you get um, one, two, three, four, five, you know, for your for your tool nose radius compensation rotations. Um, programs can be entered in three different ways. You can manually MDI or just create a program right on the machine. You can use a DNC, which is a drip feed, um, where it's coming from a network or from a USB or something like that. Pretty good chance, um, and I've, I've definitely seen this more now that I've got my own stuff. Um, like, to go to a shop, have, are you going to work? Uh, I start on the first. Okay, so there's a pretty good chance you're going to go to a place like that, and they have a three and a half floppy on the side of the machine, or they have uh, just a serial port or a parallel port on the side of the machine. My machines have no way to put a program into them by USB or anything. My, my machines were built in 93. Okay, so mine don't even have a floppy on them, which I wish they did. Because uh, that's a pretty easy conversion. You take the floppy out, you buy this little thing to put it in there. So mine, mine are set with a parallel port to a network cable. So what they had done before was they just take a network cable, fire up their laptop, and then shuttle it back and forth. Also, the machines, especially the older machines, the memory is not nearly as massive as what these machines are. So at our shop, the shop I came from, we drip fed all the time. So we had a network system. All of our machines were networked. And so we had stations throughout the shop where if you were going to run a program, you say you could hold five gigs of memory and your program was 22 gigs, uh, which would be insanely large. But um, it's just going to it's gonna handshake the program back and forth, so it's going to load up what it needs. Um, then after it runs some of that, it's going to load some more, and load some more, and load some more. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just literally drip feed that into it. Um, and then you can keep running over and over again. It's just always going to cycle back to that network or computer. You lose your connection, um, you, then you lost everything. And so that's where line numbering comes into play, where it's a little more important. Um, I would always say if you can get the program onto the machine, you want it on the machine, that's why I'm always telling you guys to stop running your programs on the USB. Um, it's too easy to have somebody come by Wiggle it, bump it, have it fall out in the middle of your program, and then you're like, I have no clue where I was. And so, and, and in our programs, no big deal. Five minutes, you're back up and going. But if you, if you're running something that's a 30 or 40 hour cycle on it, it's going to be a problem. And somebody's going to say, stop doing this. And also on our machines, I've real, I've seen or noticed that not everything runs quite the same when you're running off the USB. Sometimes graphics runs slightly different. We've even seen tool comps not quite catch as quickly as possible. Um, and there's slight delay between um, the machine and the USB. It should be microseconds, but I've had students who've had problems and I'm like, let's load it in the machine. They load it in the machine, the problem goes away. So I just, I think this is a bad idea. Um, so a couple just different ways that you can do that. Uh, we have simulators and ways that you can go out to the machine. We also have emulators on the machine to see what's going on. Remember, whether it's milling or turning, uh, it's a 2D graphic representation. Shows no depth, no color picture, no ability to have a nice symmetric view. It's just a pencil drawing as well as you get off of it. Not insanely informative, but if it draws a star and you're trying to make a moon, you know you got a problem, right? So like that's that's what it should be. If you if it shows a bunch of holes being drilled and you're drilling no holes, that's an indicator. I've got something wrong. Those are just the things. That's what graphics is for. I don't even know how the how the holes came about, but they're there. Right. I mean, I've definitely had that happen where people are like, "This is not what I thought that it was supposed to be." And, Okay, so let's figure out what's going on. Sometimes I'll load up the wrong code, but I'll know when I, wrote, when I load up the wrong code. They are, they're the same but different. Yep. Kind of like code comp on the right side versus code comp on the left side. Yep. So let's look at 
Um, back up here. One of these out. Those things I think we're okay with. Um, let's see, that's probably valuable. You could easily go to a shop that has a, a turret system like this where everything slides on a uh, game setup, so it's similar to that drill tap, uh, spotted drill tap that we have. Um, it all mounts into a dovetail. This is not a Swiss machine, even though Swiss machines do kind of look like this. That's not what this is. Just game tooling. Um, you could even have something as similar as this CNC blade that doesn't have to have a turret on it. That's not what makes the CNC. So you could have like a Doring style tool post. Um, you could have tool holders that share the same thing as the lathe, um, or I'm sorry, as the mill. Yeah. Sorry. Inserts, uh, as far as parting tools, you've got. Um, we've got two different styles out there now. We've got a neutral, which is really a grooving tool, and then we've got a, uh, a one that'll, when it parts it off, it kind of chisels it out this way, or it chisels it out the other way. So, um, a couple different ones of those. Um, here are a couple styles of grooving and turning, or grooving and parting style tools. This one's obviously been used a little bit. Um, this is, those are real common to alternate between grooving and parting. Mm -hmm. Also, you'll see those a lot of times in a combination with some type of uh, a parts puller. So we don't use parts pullers here because we really don't, we only have a couple of machines that have um, hydraulic chucks on them. We've been doing it slightly different, but a parts puller um, can either be kind of like jaws that come down and grip the part, uh, drag it out of the spindle, then close the chuck jaws, and then start from there. They also have coolant operated ones where it, when it, cut, it opens up like this, when it comes up to the front of the part, it, the, you turn the coolant on and it closes the jaws, and it'll drag your part out then that way too. There are bar feeder options and some other things like that. So here are some part pullers that you can use. Um, we used to make these. Um, and you know you, you got two and a half inch stock you bore a hole that's two and a half inches in diameter put some relief around it uh, behind it and then ability to spring a little bit <coughs> grab a hold of the front of it open up the chuck jaws drag it out close the chuck jaws drag it off of it super down and dirty really super simple to use um, here's your grip style and then bar feeders so this is bar, the bar is being fed out by a separate machine. It's communicating back and forth with it. Is it grippy? It's not. Um, one thing that I've learned about doing things like this, so when we started doing this about probably 20 years ago, the bar feeder, you would bring the turret back home, you'd open up the chuck jaws, the bar feed would come out to a set amount and then close the chuck jaws, but there would be drift in it. So it, but depending on how long the bar was, it may go out another 30, 40 thousandths, uh, which could be a huge problem when you're coming in, taking the stock off. So what we did first is we would bring in a part off cycle and we just part it off to make sure that we knew what the length was. Then we thought, gosh, we're just wasted, you know, 150 thousandths every time we're making a part. And this thing will hold like a rack of parts. So behind it, there's a ramp of stock. So it just keeps loading bars in by itself. So if you're running 30, 40 bars overnight or over the weekend when no one's there, um, it's great. It, it really is. I mean, the legs have been more automated um, than the mills for a long time. But if you're losing 150,000, 200,000, 200,000 every time, it does start to matter, you know, depending on how many parts you're doing. So what, what generally most people do is when before they bring the turret out or before they bring the stock out, they bring the turret down, run the part up run the stock up against the turret and use it as kind of a, um, a bumper to drag it out to the right length, close the chuck jaws, bring the turret away, index, 
and start going. Um, you, if you've seen our TSTs, then you know we've got parts catchers and all that stuff that it can, can do those things. So um, lots of great ways to do that. We've got collets. Um, we've got hydraulic chucks. Um, we've got manual chucks. So the TL1s have manual chucks. The, um, the STs have hydraulic chucks. So kind of knowing all of the options are really going to be the thing that you need to be thinking about. Because you've got a, you've got a great opportunity to go somewhere. Um, and they may have things that look just like what you're doing. Uh, they may have things that look nothing like you're doing. So um, knowing those things will really will be helpful. All right, so programming on the lathe, you can either do it one of two different ways. You can either do it by diameter or you can do it by radius. In, in, in 30 years, I've never seen anybody program radially. By doing that, you end up causing a whole bunch of problems in there because at some point you're going to put in X of 2 and then it's going to go to X of 4 um, because it's all on the half, right? So it's all, it's all to center on it. Um, primarily what we're doing is just looking at diameters and lengths, right? So um, these are our Z. Um, so you go back 400, uh, so Z0, you're going back 400, uh, and then you go back 900, you go back 1.4, um, and then you've got a couple diameters of one inch, an inch and an eighth, and an inch and three quarter, two inch. All right, to program a part like that, it's super, super simple. I'm just going to this out. I'm going to do just a really quick program for you. Late programming, it's like a five minute lesson. I mean, there's just, there's just not that much to it. All right, so what's the first thing I want to do? Let's just say I want to make this part, and um, we're not even going to part it off. We're just going to face it. Okay. So um, the way my start out startup line goes is just like just like the mill, um, almost just like the mill. I've got my program number, my O, and then I've got G zero, G twenty, G forty, G eighty, and then G ninety nine. Ninety nine is the one thing that's different. So, what's G0? Uh, absolutely. No, it's home. Yeah. Rapid move. I was running. Yeah. yeah. 20. Uh, Feel free to use a book or a resource. Inch quarter. Yep. So G zero is rapid. It clears out any kind of other things that are going on here. There's two, thirty-seven types of curls. It just calls it up two different times because they're different. They're just different styles of heights. Yeah. Okay. So the same, same tool, same, same little number in it. No, it's eight. Okay. So the last, the last tool is a ringer. It's not a spot drill. Okay. So rapid inch movement. What's G40? Cancel cutter column. What's G80? Cancel cycles. cycles. If they end in a zero, they cancel things. Okay. G99. Cam cycle plane return. Um. P per revolution. So are you on lathe? I don't know. 24. 
So inch per revolution or feet per revolution is the really the our only big difference here. Um, so what you said? Feed per revolution. Feed per revolution. I'm gonna put I'm gonna do this. T uh, 101. Okay, that program number. Then I can do um, I can start my spindle now if I want to. But I'm gonna start my spindle slightly different. I can even do G3 four there if I want to. So um, they, and these things can kind of be mixed and matched a little bit. Um, and then I can do a G50, S1000. G50 has dual meaning. Um, if for our meaning here in doing this, it, the spindle will, no, will not ever go over 1,000 RPM. Oh. Okay, so like when you're using G96, if you ever hear a spindle go, you're like, that sounds like it's going to explode. Um, G50 is your thing that helps it to not do that. And really where it matters is the fact that you, when you are, especially when you're on a hydraulic chuck, when the faster you spin, the less gripping power you have because of, uh, you got force pushing out. Yeah. So uh, you want to make sure that you're, you got good chuck jaw pressure on there or you got good clamping pressure, but you also want to make sure that this is, this has got a max on it. So it's, not going to go too fast. Next thing I would do is do a G96. Okay. Now, G96 set for us is really, really simple. All it's saying is, what is the surface footage that you're going to cut at? Well, we're cutting aluminum today, and it's a 600 surface footage. So I don't even have to calculate RPM. It's done. All I do is put that in, I'm done. My next move is going to be a G0, and then it's going to be a rapid move to X. And I could have put that G54, or I could have put the G54 here. I would want to start all these things up before I did my movement. Um, our stock is 2. Let's just say we're going to start at 2.1, Z.1. Now, if I want to, I could do something just to bring myself in, give myself a little bit of safety where I could maybe bring it in Z five inches, sorry, five inches. And then I could go um, Z point one. Okay, so now I've wrapped it at five. Yes, that checks out that it's five. Yes, then I bring it up to 100,000 in front of my part. That way I don't plow into it. Hopefully not. <clears throat> yeah, hopefully not. All right. From this point, then, um, I would probably just go over and go Z0 and then G1 X minus 0 0.03 feed of 12,000 per revolution. That would face that part off down to negative 30,000. I want to go past that. I want to go past zero so I can get that little nipple off of that part. If I go straight down to zero, um, it'll leave that little dimple in the center. Yeah, you get because you've got tool nose radius, right? Yeah. So you've got insert, and then you got to go beyond it. Thirty thousandths, and I will cover, you know, thirty to fifty thousandths will cover just about anything. Then what I will do, I like redundancy, so I'm going to go back to I'm going to go back to this section. So I'm going to go G zero. X of 2.1, Z.1. Okay, so all I do is come in, face it off, retract back up to 2.1 and 1. That puts me in the spot where I'm going to start my fucking cycle. All right, you with me up here? I'm going to erase this. Wait, wait, let me, let me photo. Let me I'm right, I was just running out, running out of room. Yeah. Is why I'm doing that. Just warn us when you're going to erase it. Yeah. Like yeah. Like on the one day you, you were programming the mill, I tried to get photos and you were, it was already half gone. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah stop me anytime or, you know, if, if I'm standing in front of it, pretty good chance I'll move away from it, but often, or not often, but sometimes I do. So, okay, I've faced it off. Now um, I'm going to go into my rubbing cycle. My rubbing cycle is a G71, and it is P, it is Q, it is U. It is W, it is D, it is F. Okay. I'm filling 
gaps on those in just a moment. Now, depending on what kind of your machine it is, and, and the only reason why I'm saying some of these things is because I kind of got out of the habit of saying some of this stuff. Like, on my machines, a straight FANUC machine, like a Mori, um, this is actually broken up into two separate lines. So it's, it goes G71, um, U and R, and then it goes G71 again, P, Q, U, W, F. The first one, the U and the R, is definitely cut, redirect value. The second, so you end up with G71, G71 right on top of each other. Um, which before I came here, that's the only way I had ever programmed. But I programmed in this singular G71 for 10 years. And so like I went back to my panic and started programming the broken cycle and it just goes, it's like basically said in Japanese, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, I clearly have my format wrong. So uh, I'm going to explain what these go to in just a minute, but I'm going to do a line number of N1. Um, N1 only matters in this, this when I'm using a G71. Other than that, I'm typically not line number. What is N? Just a line number. Okay. And it can be anything that you want. So it can be N100. It can be N117, 11, or 1017. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the finished shape of the OD of this part. Okay. So it's always going to start, the format always starts the same way, and it is going to be a rapid move to its smallest diameter, which is one inch, right? Yeah. Okay, always going to be that way. Next move will be a G1. And it's going to go back 400,000. At this point, I could put a feed rate. That feed rate would then correspond to my finish cycle. I can also put it on the finish cycle. So, you know, sprinkles, no sprinkles, you know, it's, these are just options, right? You don't have to do these things. All right, next, I'm going to go up to X 1.25. Two five. Um, then I'm going to go back to C900. Then I'm going to go up, I'm going to go diagonally. Um, X 1.25, Z minus 1.4. I'll step back in just a moment. Um, then I'll go X two inches. This line needs to be What? You didn't cut diagonally. It should be X one point seven five. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Um one point seven five. And then this is going to be in 1018. And I think it goes up to 2 inches, uh, x 2.0. And okay, that's it for now. <clears throat> this will cut the entire outside shape of this part um, after we fill in a couple gaps. If you put 1017 here, Okay, that P is where the where the cycle starts. Is the definition of the outside shape. Q where it ends. Where it ends. So you block it in. So you have to have the ends in there. Though. You do have to have the end numbers. Okay. You have to have, you, and it can be it can be one and two. Yeah. It can be twenty five and twenty six. You can line number everything. And, and they may not even be, they might be 117 and 122. So it just needs to know where it starts and stops. So if you're like, I love the idea of line numbers, I'm going to line number in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You just need to know it starts at 7 and 12 or wherever, wherever it is at. Okay? So it's just the blocking in of this section is all you're doing. U is how much you want to leave in X. We'll leave 10. Uh, 
W is how much you want to leave in Z. What do you mean? How much stock do you want to leave for finish pass? Oh, okay. okay. If you don't want to leave a finish pass, then you go for the U and W in there. So, since you don't have a finish pass in there, technically. I will in a moment. You will in a moment. So, not, he doesn't have any. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is just the roughing cycle. Okay. So, I'm going to leave, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave 10 thousandths in, in X. And the only reason why U is the designation for it is because U is the incremental designation for X. W is an incremental designation for, for Z. So, um, and then my depth of cut, 0.1, and my feed rate is 15. Okay, that's my roughing feed rate and my depth of cut. Now, like I said, you can have a feed rate here on your first feed line. Will will define the feed rate of your finish pass, but you can also have it someplace else. Okay. So what it does, what the, yeah? So on the P and Q line, does that have to be the same 17? It does not be any number that you want it to be. Here's what you can't do. So like yeah, tip. P being two, that does P being one or what? I don't know if you can go backwards with it. I've always <laughs> went forward. <Right. laughs> the I mean, first time he hears about it, can we go backwards? Right. Dude, I, yeah, let's confuse I want to know the extent. So generally on a on a lathe, the only time that I'm I'm adding in uh, line numbers are in my rough cycles. So my my first tool normally has N1 and N2. My second tool normally has N3 and N4. My third tool has N5 and N6. Those are the only places where I typically do it. Um, if I do it anywhere else, um, I would do it at a tool change. If I had a massive amount of tools. And I would do N100 for T1, N200 for T2. That way I can do a number search really fast to find a certain piece of information in the program. So like if I know I need to um, pick back up, like let's just say at the end of the day happened, I was 10, 10 tools through a 20 tool project. I could come in that next morning, turn my machine on, start then at N10, you do an N10 search, and then find my 10th tool and turn on it. Okay. So all the machine's doing is it's doing the math. So it, it's going, hey, our shape of our part looks like that. Okay, center line, that will be mirrored down there. Uh, we're going to do this by 100s. It just figured out. That we need to do that. It just did all that math for you. Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if the mill did that? I want to do, I got a four inch block, I want to do this, I want to do that. I mean, that's kind of what conversational programming does, right? So like it's going, you're saying, I've got a part that's four by six, I want to face it off. Oh, two inch shell mill, how much are we going to step over? Inch and a half, okay. It's going to try to kind of figure out what you want to do. Um, you lose all abilities to do kind of customizing in that, but um, it, it does serve its purpose. All right, so that, just did the math for us. That leaves it really rough. Uh, it'll do a pre-finished pass um, just to try and take the steps out because like the angle is going to be like, it's going to look like a, a, a ziggurat or a, like a Mayan style pyramid with the not smooth walls but steps across it. Um, so then to get that out of there, you go G70 P Q And then if you want to, this, or you could have put it here. This recalls P1017 to P1018, reruns it at the speed rate. And it takes out the speed rate. Yeah, it brings the size now. You had your U and W offset in there, and now it takes it out. I got you. This does not have to run immediately after this. So let's say I want to face it off. I want to rough it out. I want to drill it. Um, I'm going to turn another diameter on it. I want to do all my roughing. Then I want to come in and do G70, 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 G70 for like several other things. As long as I'm calling on my tool for that, then, then that would be it. If this was a different tool, I would just need to have another startup line in there, and then this would be separate. This would be, this would be using the same tool. 
Okay, so like if I was going to do a separate tool, it would be T202, G0, G40, G80, G99, G54, X0, or G0, X2.1, Z.1, then G70, and be done. All right, so then after this, uh, everybody good with what we have here? I'm going to erase this. After it's done with that, it will return it back to 2.1 in Z and, uh, sorry, 2.1 in X and then uh, 0.1 in Z. All right. Feel okay about that? Let's talk part off. Uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. It's just a Really simple face off turn and I think part off. Um, let's just say our tool is tool four. Again, G0, G20, 40, 80, and 99. Um, G54. And if I want to, um, I can move that there. I can move at that point or not. Um, G50. Uh, on this one, I want to go S sub like 300 for my max demo speed. G96. Again, still S600. Turn the spindle on there. Um, G0, X2.1, Z.1. Wait, so if you think you're. G50, that's your max, right? Is, you said the spindle is 300. So, when, so what's the, oh, that's, that's just surface footage. Surface footage from, yeah. Okay. So I want it to not go over 300. Yeah. And that, so, you know, because larger diameter, slower it turns, smaller diameter, faster it turns. So, uh, all, what I, why I'm going to do something like this is I don't want that part to be parting off at like 3,000 RPM. Like a freaking flying saucer at that point, right? It's like a projectile. Um, so then for the Haas, you can, so well, I'm not even there yet. So all I did was come back up to my startup point. I always go back to the front of the part and like where I started at, one, because I like um, redundancy and symmetry. Um, then I wrap it back to how far I want to go. On this part, it's 1.4 inches long, right, at this point. So let's just say we want to go back and make it two inches long. Two point one two five is what I want to wrap it back. So I got an eighth inch wide through my tool. If I was using cutter compensation, I could probably push this to go to two, where I could say, hey, my tool is one eighth of an inch wide. I, I need to move on long further. It would be a better, it would be a cleaner program for an operator because they would see it going back two inches. Seeing two and an eighth, if, a, if an operator is reading through the code, they could cycle stop at that point and go, hey, you're going back an eighth of an inch too far back. Some people would catch it, some people wouldn't. So this is where maybe cutter compensation or, or a slight work shift might be helpful. But um, for what we're doing, we're not going to worry about it this time. G75. Um, X minus 0 0.030. What's the G75? What is a G75? It's not in the book, it's what it is. It's in there. You just have to, might have to look around at the cycles. G75 is a grooving cycle. And it can either be used for a part off or a wide groove. So like John's getting ready to work on a part that it's got some grooves like this in it. You could use it as stepping over. Could you use a bit for that? Uh, no, I think you have a live tooling, yeah. Like if you over here on the ST, you could bring that in, spin that in. Here's the only problem that you end up with live tooling um, or A axis rotational stuff is you, you can develop a small end mill flat on 
a section of it as you rotate in. So you really kind of want to think about how you come in and out of the park or where you're going to position that end on add on. Yeah, single point in G75. Um, are you looking at can cycles on the lake? What's that? 36. 36. 36. I don't think I'm going to go. So it can be used for stepping over yeah. or stepping down. In this case, we're going to step down. So we're going to end with negative 30. We're going to go in increments of 30 thousandths. We're going to feed a three. It's going to go increment 130. Okay, I got you. And then when it's done, it's going to wrap it back to 2.1, negative um, 2 and 8. At this point, I don't trust anyone or anything. I always go Z minus 2.125. What I don't want to have happen is this thing magically, there is no way this would do this. This just makes me feel better. What I don't want it to do is part off and then travel across and mistakenly, like, like my offset was wrong and it left like an eighth of an inch down the bottom and it didn't cut it off and my particle would drag across there and just rip off. So I go ahead and put this in here um, at, at a Z movement and then um, and an X movement. Okay, so I don't want to move. Those two things can be rotated too. They, they can be they can be transposed. A it could be X first and then Z. I want to go, I want to make sure I'm back that same distance and I want to make sure I'm up that same distance, right? I just don't want to. Where did negative, I probably would do, actually, I'd probably do the future. Where did negative 2.1, wouldn't that bring it forward in your spending? I'm already back up. I'm already there. I just told it to stay in the same place where it's oh, at. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I just hit a rapid move back, rapid move up, just to make sure. Like it's not it's not going to do anything different, yeah. but but my peace of mind says like I don't know the control that I might be walking up to. Like if it's a machine that I run every single day, yeah, I know it. If it's a machine that like maybe four or five people run, and some ding dong in front of me has a tendency to go, oh, man, I think it can save 13 seconds on this part by doing these things, and he turns some parameters and some safeties off. A huge problem. Right. Um, you know, we see, like, I, where I came from, we, we told our machines you had to be on one limit switch before you could change tools. Uh, but not everybody was like that. So you either need to go all the way back in Z, rotate tools, go back in, or you need to go all the way up in X, rotate tools, come back in. But you don't have to do that. Ours, um, our TL1s, depending on what the parameter setup is, while it is drilling, if you choose to change tools, you can change tools in the middle of drilling cycle, which is not good, right? Or you can be threading across something and then go, I want to drill now, and it's right there. So having some redundancies in there is peace of mind. <laughs> so, so then I would do something like a Z1, and just get that out of there, you know, and then uh, if I was using it for a stop, I'd move it, or then M30 essentially after that, stop the spindle and cool and everything, shut it off. All right, so that is, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. I know that's pretty fast, but I mean, as far as like programming on the lathe versus programming on the mill, uh, it, this is elementary, yeah. really is. Uh, now, it, I, I don't want to say that it doesn't get more complicated, but in just your basic movements, um, if you can define the finished shape of the part, then you're done. Internal turning or boring is the exact same thing in reverse. Okay, it, it's, it's still a G71. You're going to start small, and you're going to work your way out. So um, on your before we had our rapid move to the lowest diameter, we're going to have our rapid move to the highest diameter. We're just going to define the shape in reverse. Mm -hmm. um, this is back, right? 
Yeah. And so, so you're gonna you're gonna tell it, you know, this is how how big I am, this is how far back I'm going. You're gonna start after you drill your hole, um, and then or you got a tubing or whatever, and then you're gonna go ahead and start just doing internal stuff. On the TL woods, we do not do a ton of internal turning, only because we only have those four stations on the tools. Uh, we typically turn those up with turning tools, threading tools, grooving tools, parting tools, and so on and so forth. So there's not a lot of room to get those in. Next semester, when we have those eight stations turrets, you'll be able to get in there and have a little more options on internal stuff. Now, if I'm going to rough it with a 30 and finish it with a 15, then I would just change this to 485, and I would leave it that way for the entire time. Because the roughing cycle is going to leave stock. It's not going to, it's not going to overcut it. So you don't even have to do G2s and G3s for your radial cuts on on the roughing cycle. You can, uh, and and I would say this: if the if the radius is really big and sweeping, I would probably bring in a G two or G three. Or if I'm doing like a big dish dome style setup, I would probably bring in a G two or G three. So circular circulation, just like we would do on the mill, where we're going around a corner. Same thing here: if you're just doing around a corner, just lay it on its side. Okay. So whenever you do it, do you Two and D three, do you have to still do it like the same way in the middle when you tell it to start point and finish point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the line will get slightly different, so it's going to have its its start point where it might go back. Um, uh, we said this was three, so it's going to go back two and a half inches. Mm -hmm. uh, then it's going to go into its G two or G three and land back up at the destination point of where it is in X and where it is in Z, and then your radius for it. So yeah. I subtracted the tool nose radius of the uh, insert from it is all that I did. But if you are, um, if you're in the middle of, uh, if you're going to do a, a G2 or G3, you're just going to put the radius of it 
in there. If you're using um, tool notes compensation, if you're not using tool notes compensation, then you'll need to kind of mentally compensate for it. It's also a really good idea to, to denote that somewhere on the part. No tool note, no tool note radius compensation. Your operator should see it when they see that there's only T101 or T202, and they don't see a T20202. That should that should be the flag to go. Oh, there must be a tool that's comp in this thing. So they when they're setting up their tools, they'll have to come in and set that sec, second uh, tool that's comp. So exact same style capping holders that we would use on a mill, spring loaded. Um, our machines have rigid tapping in them, so it synchronizes the spindle. So when it goes in, it knows where it's at when it comes out. Not all machines do. So you can use something like this. Um, we use it in conjunction with our um, our rigid tapping just because it's just the safety factor. So if you've got some spring loaded, that way you can have a little bit off. Or if your spindle drifts just a little bit, it's going to compensate for it as it goes back around. Um, internal threading or external threading uh, is G76 or G92. Um, but we're not there yet. We're just getting started. But um, so you can use some of those exact same tool holders, a tool holder, a tool holder, a tool holder. I have used a broom handle, a car. Um, I have used a broom handle on blades before. So it does not matter what it is that you're doing. So we used to make these things, and I won't, it, it, would, be a, it would be a poor statement to say here. Um, we used to take these broom handles and cut a slit down the end of them and put um, emery paper on them, wrap them around them, and use them as kind of a hone. And um, you, we would have times where we might chuck that up in a tool holder, bring it in, and sandpaper the inside of something. Do you ever use aluminum ones as shims? Aluminum mop handles? I've never had an aluminum mop handle. No, mop. A mop is a broom? Yes. Yeah, it's kind of. The kinda, broom is a wet mop. Or, I mean, a, a mop. wet wait, a wait, mop wait, wait, is a. Wait, 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 wait. Well, no, I'm gonna just say what I said. A wet mop. Mop. broom is a wet mop. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Because a tarantula is handy. I mean, it, and it could yeah, be. It could be. It could be. Dude, that's all I've sense. eaten crickets. So. I mean, I've eaten crickets. Scrub, yeah. Baby scrub. Yeah. So, um, all right. I don't know. Yeah. All right, let's see if there's one more that we can squeeze in here real quick. This is probably enough to get going. Bad news yet. So. Good. This our first part. So your first part. Lovely. Instructions for turning number one: begin with a one-inch diameter stock. Hold the hold out of the chuck by one inch. Use tool one. Use tool four. Um, take a single face pass Z zero. Then. Um, one OD pass at 950. You will need to turn back 5 8 minimum to account for the part off blade width. Next, turn the 850 diameter. Uh, finally, part off using part or using tool four. All right, so here is just a really simple part for us to do together. Um, no pan cycles, just single movements of the machine. So, really, this is just in the simplest, simplest way. How do I start my program now? T101. Right. 
Six and then you have for oh, yeah, yeah. zero program name, zero, blah, 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 three. Program name? Yeah. And then you've got your parentheses there. So if you do accidentally put a G90 in your program, it will say multiple codes or something like that. Because that's ODI printing, right? Um, it's, it's absolute programming, um, but it sees that programming as like you've already established that. So it's, it's going, you already said that. Why are you saying it again? All right, so my tool one is my tool that's going to cut this 950 diameter and then an 800,000 diameter. And that's going to be. So, two, four. Yeah. So I can do a G54 right now. Um, it doesn't. It does not have any movement. If you want to try to save some lines, you can also do this. Let's go ahead and start our spindle. G50. Uh, S1000, and then G96, S600, M3. Then you could do a G54 and go X1.1, .1, Z.1, .1, if you wanted to do that. Save yourself a line and do that. Um, it does matter, you know. Uh, I mean, one line over a whole program code, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, it does take milliseconds to read all those lines, and milliseconds matter over millions of parts. So, um, so now, what would I do? I'm programmed. Um, I've got my stock, or I've got my part that I'm making that looks like this. Uh, I am currently. My insert is sitting right here. What do I do? Face uh, How do I do that? Uh, Tell me what to move. Give me a second, I need to consult the photos. I'll let you consult the photos. Give me two seconds. Just give me a minute. X1 and then Z minus 0.03. Okay. You are darn close. Okay. So I'm sitting right now at X 1.1, Z 0.1. Oh, you need to bring it to 0.0 first. And then now what? Now X minus 0.03. Make sure there's no need like that one. It's gonna be pretty fast. We have to set a point zero point five G one. G one. Okay. Now from this point, let's bring it back up to here. So it just brought ourselves back up to that spot again, right? So we came over. Did that. We are, per instructions, we're going to take one pass across the outside at 950. Is that what it says? Yeah. 950. Okay. So we're going to go to X.95. Okay. So it could, it could be a rapid move. All right, we're already at rapid. Now we're going to go G1, Z minus 0.3. Uh, no, we're, this is the OD of the part. Oh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Yeah, I think the instructions said something else. I think it said to go ahead and go 5 eighths of an inch back. Mm -hmm. for, because the part for the part of it. Um, 
Do I have to put a feed rate on this line? No. I do already have a feed rate established. It will revert back to that last feed rate. Okay. Um, so next, I can go G0, X 1.1, and then I can go Z 0.1. All I'm going to do is just go up, over, put myself back to where I was, right? Back to my startup line. So I went and just did a Like that. Now I'm ready to go G0, or I'm sorry, I'm already in zero. Eight hundred and fifty. G one Z minus what? to get out of the way so I can do a tool change. So I'm going to go Z five inches and then I'm going to do an M01 optional stop. And then I can go ahead and do T, I think it says 404 for the instructions. And then start line and then G50 and then G96 and then G54 X 1.1 uh, Z 0.1 then what would I do from this point on? So you go uh, you probably bring it Z one and a half so I'm already at 1.1. I've cleared the part in X. Yeah. My stock's one inch. Yeah. So go X 65. Z. Oh, Z to 65 and X. Yeah. So just Z. Yeah. Uh, so you've got it. That's cool. Yeah. Now from here on out. This one I did is slightly different. I came up big, way big, and then fed rapid and way back, and then I went up. So same movements after my cycle. Parted it off, brought it up, then I brought it up, and then I brought it over. So I was out of the way. 
So on something like that, where I'm just going to take a couple passes across it, I don't need to make G71. It, it would be almost more lines than necessary. Um, but now let's just say I was going to take 15,000 passes on that. Now it now it validates doing a G71. Single passes, not necessary. Multi pass, necessary. What was that for? Um, I just want to show you. So you've got this part, and then I've got. Uh, I don't care if you make that or not, but I want you to make this. But if you'll notice, the difference between this, it's three inch, it's almost three inch stock. And it starts at 1.6. So it's worth making multiple passes on, right? Yeah, I can go Yeah, I'm not even sure that we have any three inch stock, but I'll do some double checking and make sure that we do. Um, I, we may have some three inch, like Delrin or something like that. We can just make this part out of. Um, but yeah, this is what I want you to program. And so it's just super simple. And just everything builds off of this. It's just like face milling and contouring. Everything builds off of face milling and contouring. So, same thing. Okay. If you have not had, or if you've not been working on any of your, like, book assignments, then you need to be on those. We are in, um, we got, what, three weeks left after this? So we, we end at roughly May 15th-ish. I think it's 12th or something like that. Oh, really? That's our last day of classes? I think, yeah, I think we got about... I'm, I thought I know finals week. I think the, the 12th to the 17th. So. Yeah, so I will say, you know, typically mid May is, is about when we are. It's got to be done before commencement. So, uh, okay, that's it. All Questions? Right. Uh, so, I Right, so I haven't given anything like that out yet, but there, when there, there's like a PowerPoint or a, an assignment, there's like an assignment on that PowerPoint, those assignments are due. And the PowerPoint with the assignments? Okay. Yeah, student programming is the part that you're making. Um, and so like the, the ones where like the guided programs and stuff like that, you don't have to make those. Um, you can make those if you want to, if you just want to have some help on doing that. What I like to do is I just want to show you how to do it, and then we're kind of stepping away from it, and then you're doing it all by yourself after that. Because what happened to me a long time ago is I would go out and make a program like this, and everybody was like, yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Well, I just, yeah, of course. I mean, you can understand about anything when somebody explains every single thing to you, and then all you got to do is copy it. And so then I would, I would mix the program up slightly, and they were like, what do we do? So I was like, let's stair step this thing out. And so it kind of developed into that.